and welcome to Studio on a Budget's Guide to Home Recording, Volume 3, More Top Secret Home Recording Techniques. In this video, we're going to expand on what we've learned in Volumes 1 and 2 of this series. I'm going to be showing you some of the secret techniques that professional recording engineers use in the big studios. Rather than try to completely cover every aspect of the recording process, though, I'm going to be focusing on tips and techniques you can use in your home studio with the equipment you probably already have. If not, you'll know what equipment you need to get in the future to emulate what the big studios are doing. We're going to cover a lot of information, so don't try to absorb all of it at once. Remember, you can refer back to the video when you need specific information on a topic. Okay, turn on your recording equipment and let's learn some top secret home recording techniques. I'd like to start where I left off in volume two. We had finished laying down all of our tracks and we were preparing to mix down the song. As you recall, we have instruments and vocals recorded on tracks one through eight on the eight track recorder and our drums and piano tracks are recorded over on the computer sequencer in the keyboard. Here's how the tracks are laid out as recorded in volume two. At this point, everything is recorded separately and is on its own track. Basically, what we're going to do now is this. We're going to combine or mix all of these tracks together via our mixer and record the mixed stereo signal onto another tape deck, in this case, a PCM encoder. Or you may be using a cassette recorder. This will be your master tape, and you'll make additional cassette copies from this tape. There's a lot more to mixing, though, than just bringing up the levels to the right volumes and starting. Besides adjusting the correct levels for each track, we'll be tailoring the sound with equalization, or EQ for short, adding effects like reverb and delay, adjusting pan position, and using other creative tools like noise gates and compressors to customize the sound. This is all pretty complicated, so I'll take you through the process one step at a time. The first thing you should do before you begin mixing any song is normalize the board. This means that you turn all the volumes completely down. In this case, this means pulling our faders all the way down. Turn all the pan knobs to the center position, turn all effects like reverb and delay down, and turn all effect sends down as well. These are volume knobs which determine how much of an effect you want to add to any given track. Now, what we're going to do is listen to the tracks one at a time and see if we need to clean up any of the tracks with EQ. Before we do, though, let's talk a little bit about exactly what EQ is. As you probably know, we divide sound into three rough frequency categories, bass or lows, mid-range or mids, treble or highs. These frequencies are expressed in units that we call hertz. This chart shows you the frequencies in hertz on a piano keyboard. Although there's some overlap, we think of bass frequencies as running from around 20 hertz to around 200 hertz. The mid-range frequencies go from around 200 hertz to around 5,000 hertz. And finally, the highs go from around 5,000 hertz on up to about 16,000 hertz, which is just about as high as we humans can hear. Frequencies above 1,000 hertz we often abbreviate. For example, 5 kilohertz, or 5K for short which is the same as 5,000 hertz for you non-metric types. Using the EQ knobs on our mixer will boost or cut certain frequencies on individual tracks if need be. Each channel on the mixer has the same EQ knobs. This allows us to set a certain EQ for each particular track that we may feel needs adjusting. There are three basic reasons for using EQ. Number one, to compensate for tone problems of a particular track instrument or vocal. Number two, to enhance the tone and number three, as a mixing tool to help tracks sit in the mix better. I'll go through each of these in a moment. This mixer has a semi-parametric equalizer, meaning that not only do I have control over the bass, mid-range, and treble, but I also have control as to exactly where in the bass or mid-range I want to adjust the EQ. The knobs in this column are all EQ volume knobs. If I crank the bottom knob to the right, the amount of bass on that track increases, and the same with the mid-range. You're all familiar with this. You may not be familiar with these knobs, though. 
These knobs let you determine what frequency you want to cut or boost. For example, these two knobs are linked together. This is our bass volume knob right here, and this knob lets us sweep from really low bass, 60 hertz, up to the lower mid-range, 100 hertz. These two knobs go together as well. This is our mid-range volume, and this knob sweeps from 400 hertz to around 6,000 hertz. I'll play a track and show you how it sounds. Here's the bass track running through mixer channel 5. The EQ volume knobs are set in the middle right now, so we're not changing the tone at all right now. Now I'll boost the bass volume knob with the frequency knob set at the lowest setting. Immediately the level meters go up because there's a lot of electronic energy in this frequency. Now I'm going to leave the volume knob up and sweep the frequency knob upward and listen to the difference. Now I'll return the bass EQ volume to the center and do the same thing with the mid-range. You can really change the sound this way for the better or the worse. Here are two secrets for effectively using EQ. These will come as a shock, so brace yourself. Try not to use EQ for corrective purposes. Now you're probably saying, what? Well, if you're using EQ for corrective purposes, you're probably just trying to correct a problem that shouldn't have been there in the first place. Usually poor miking. Here's what you should do. If you find that there's too much bass in your singer's voice, don't reach for the bass knobs on the EQ. Instead, move the mic back, or better yet, roll off some bass frequencies on the mic. If your guitar track is too bright, correct the problem at the amp and the guitar before you reach for the EQ. If you follow this advice regularly, your recordings will sound 100% better. Next, whenever possible, cut EQ instead of boosting it. If you're like most musicians, you've probably never turned an EQ knob to the left. In fact, you've probably never turned any knob to the left. Here's why you should. Let's say we want to hear more bass out of the guitar. Our first inclination is to boost the EQ on the bass until we hear more. But when we boost the EQ, look what happens to our master levels. They go way up, so we have to bring the master faders down to compensate. We don't want them in the red, remember? What we've really done is lower our signal to noise ratio. Our tape will sound worse, not better. Not only that, but the bass track is getting all washed out. Here's what we should have done. Instead of boosting the bass EQ, we can accomplish the same thing by cutting the bass frequencies on tracks that may be masking the guitar's bass frequencies. In this case, the biggest culprit would probably be these piano tracks. There's a lot of left-hand bass stuff going on that's fighting for attention with the guitar and bass guitar tracks. First, we turn the bass EQ volume down a little bit on the piano tracks. Now we'll sweep through the frequencies until we hear less piano bass and more guitar bass. That's better. Not only have we accomplished the same thing, but we can boost our master faders to compensate for the missing piano bass frequencies, which improves our signal to noise ratio. Very good. One other tip, be careful when you boost the highs on tape tracks. There's tape hiss and other noise in the higher frequencies that you may be boosting along with the signal. You never tell me you love me, so I'll wait by Okay, the let's start with track number one to see if it needs any major changes in EQ. This is the lead vocal me. track. I can tell by the spell that I'm under. You think I'm gone, you got another thing. This track sounds pretty I'm good because you'll recall we went to great lengths to get it to sound good when we recorded it in volume two. My love for you is simply overflowing and I know. I may cut the upper bass frequencies just a little bit. I'm holding on to the memories. Memory. Track two is another vocal doubled. See you coming back to me. This sounds pretty good too. Back to me. 
Later on, when all the tracks are up, we may mess with the EQ further, but for now, we're just looking for major changes. Maybe I can make you mine. Tracks three and four are backup vocals, and again, we made an effort while recording to make sure that the EQ was really good. Track five is our bass guitar. Steve's got a really nice bass, so that we really don't need to do too much corrective EQing. Might boost the uh, low frequencies here just a little bit, so it'll cut through the mix a little more. Later, we may cut some of the mid-range so that we can cut frequencies that might fight with the vocals. Also, there are, doesn't seem to be too much happening in the high end here, so we'll roll it off. This is a good idea. If there's no high end, you can roll off these frequencies, cut back on our tape hiss and other noise. Track 6 is the rhythm guitar. Well, here comes that sax lead on track 7. Sounds pretty good on its own. Track six is the uh, rhythm guitar here. I might boost some of the mid ranges just a little bit, help it cut through the mix. These are just rough changes at this point. Okay, coming in on channels eight, nine, ten, and eleven are the drum tracks. Eight and nine are the auxiliary drums, everything except the kick and snare. We have them pan hard left and hard right. The toms are programmed to pan from right to left, just like that. We won't change any EQ at this point, maybe later on in the mix. Here's the kick drum coming in on 10. I've boosted the bass here a little bit. Also, the treble is where the beater bar is on the sampled sound. It'll help the kick drum cut through the mix a little better. Here's the snare coming in on 12. 11, excuse me. We can boost the high end just a little bit, maybe the upper mid. Help that cut through the mix. Again, this is just corrective EQ at this point. We'll make subtle changes later on. And finally, our piano tracks, which are also pan hard left and hard right, because it's a stereo send from our keyboard. This doesn't need any corrective EQ at this point. Okay, now that we've checked each part for corrective EQ needs, let's start by bringing the tracks up together. First we start with the drums and the bass tracks. These tracks will form the foundation for the song. First we want to make sure that the bass and the kick drum don't fight with each other. To do this, we'll find the kick's fundamental frequency. I do this by raising the volume knob on the bass EQ, on the parametric EQ, and then sweeping from lower bass to mid bass. That's the bass's fundamental frequency. You can tell because it really jumps out at you when you've hit it. Now we want to make sure that the bass isn't fighting with that frequency. Good. The bass's fundamental frequency seem to be more in this area. And they sound pretty good together. Let's bring up the rest of the drums. The idea here is that every part in our song gets its own space in the range of frequencies. If two parts play primarily in the same frequency range, we won't be able to tell them apart very well. This is why some mixes sound muddy. Everything is fighting for our attention in the same frequency. This graphic simplifies what I'm talking about. I've illustrated the most important or primary frequencies of each track. When we mix, we try to use EQ to let each track have its own space in the spectrum. Okay, with the drums and the bass up, I like to set the levels so that the master VUs are at about minus four at this point. We're basically leaving room for the rest of the tracks.
Okay, with the bass and the drums up, let's bring up the other tracks. The lead vocals on one and two, which remember would pan hard left and hard right. We'll cut those bass frequencies just a little bit and boost the upper mid to help it cut through the mix. No backup vocals yet in this part of the song, so let's move to the guitar. Let's cut the bass frequencies just a little bit so that it won't fight with the bass guitar quite as much. And we'll boost the upper mid to help it cut through the mix. Here's the backup vocals. We'll boost their upper mid a little bit too. So they'll blend in with the other vocals and cut through the mix a little better. Now let's bring up the vocal delay. We want this to be very, very subtle. Great, that sounds pretty good. Okay, our EQ is now roughly set, and we're ready to start polishing the mix with effects, like reverb. Okay, now that we've got the EQ roughly adjusted, let's add one of the most important things we can use to make our home recording sound professional. Digital reverb. Digital reverb is an amazing and yet relatively inexpensive studio tool. Tastefully used, it will add a world of difference to the sound of your home recordings. Notice I said digital reverb. The reverb on your amplifier is usually created with a spring. Digital reverbs use computer chips to actually recreate different locations, like rooms, chambers, or stadiums. They can also restore the ambience you lose when you close mic instruments and vocals. Listen to the lead vocal on track one. You think I'm gone, you got another As you recall, we recorded her very close to the mic so as to avoid you. any room noise and get a high signal-to-noise ratio. On its own, the track sounds somewhat flat and lifeless. This is because we don't ordinarily hear things without any reverb I'm from the walls around us, so the track memories. sounds unnatural. You think I'm gone, you got now listen to the same track as I add a little bit of digital reverb. In love with you. My love for you is simply overflowing and I know that you love me too. Quite a difference, isn't it? I'm holding on to Now you don't want to drench the track or it'll sound unnatural. Memories. I don't care what they say, one day I'll see you with me. Never tell me you love me. Right now I have the so reverb I'll set on a small room meaning that the reverb is processing the vocal to make it sound as if she's singing in a small room. Paging through the different types of reverb will give us a lot of choices on the quality of reverb we want to use. My love for you is simply overflowing and I know that you love me too. Notice that as I do this, the track takes on very different emotional qualities with each reverb chosen. Memories. I see you coming back to me, back to me. I'm feeling alright, so maybe I can make you mine. I won't stop until I'm satisfied. Take your time and go through many different reverbs until you find the one that best enhances the sound. Bigger studios often have many different digital reverbs used in the same song. They'll run each track through its own reverb to give it its own unique characteristic. They'll also do this next top secret recording technique. You can achieve really unusual and effective results by stacking two digital reverbs on top of each other. I'll show you how this might work. Here's a snare drum that's dry, no reverb at all. First I'll send it into reverb number one and add some gated reverb, 
which is a popular effect with the snare drum. Now I'll send this signal into reverb number two and add ambience by adding a large room reverb to the gated snare. Now listen to the difference when we take all the reverb away. Since this is a studio on a budget series though, I'm going to assume that you just have one reverb, and if you don't have one, you should buy one. By the way, when you hook up your reverb, make sure and patch it into your board in stereo, with two channels panned hard left and right. You should do this even if you're only going into one channel on the reverb, because most reverbs synthesize stereo, so take advantage of it. So, now that we're hooked up, what gets reverb? Well, it's really up to you. There are no rules that can't be broken. But here are a few techniques that pros use to help get you started. Let's start with the drums. Generally, you don't want to put much, if any, reverb on the kick drum. If you do add some, wait until the end so you can tell if it really makes a difference when everything else has been treated. It may not, and if you add it now, it may just muddy up the mix. The snare, on the other hand, is a different story. Many of the current popular recordings have a heavily treated snare drum. Here it is dry. Let's add some reverb now. Oh, that's too much. Let's bring up the toms and the cymbals. We'll put the same amount of reverb on each one of these as this is a stereo track here, left and right. A little bit of reverb helps restore the ambience on these tracks. I recommend that you do not add any reverb to the bass. You'll very rarely be able to hear it in the final mix, and all it will do is muddy up the mix. And you don't want that, so leave the reverb off. I almost always put reverb on the vocals, however. In fact, it's a common practice to put a little more reverb on the backup vocals than on the lead vocal. The rhythm guitar already has reverb on it from the amplifier. Be careful and not overdo it on your vocals reverb. This could use a little more reverb. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the use of digital delay. Many people confuse the terms delay and reverb. A delay delays the entire signal and then sends it back to you a moment later. You can control the timing of the delay through various controls. A reverb, on the other hand, tries to simulate an acoustic environment through hundreds of simultaneous delays of different types. A simple delay will sound something like this. Hello, 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 hello. Okay. Now, a reverb, on the other hand, would sound something like this. Hello. Both are important and both have their uses in the studio. So, you should own both a digital reverb and a digital delay in your home studio. For now, though, I'd like to share a studio trick using digital delay to create a monster guitar sound. Here's how the rhythm guitar sounds on track 6, Pan to the Center. Now I'll run the guitar through the digital delay and set the delay for about 25 milliseconds. I'll pan the original signal dry all the way left, bring up the delay, and pan the delayed signal all the way right. To really appreciate this, you can put on a pair of headphones. Let's compare it to the original signal. The guitar, with this effect, has a much wider stereo spread.
Now let's experiment with putting some delay on the vocals. At this point you may run into a problem. Many of you have only one digital delay and it's generally not a good thing to run several tracks through the same delay. In this case if I were to send the vocal through the delay as it's set right now the delay would be mixed with the guitar which is panned hard right for our monster guitar trick. Not a good thing. Here's how we can use more than one setting with one delay. You can expand your effects capabilities by printing the effects to tape. This means that once I decide on a vocal delay setting, I record the delayed signal only to one of the tape tracks. Now that the vocal's delay is on tape, our digital delay box is freed up to use on the guitar track that we set a moment ago. Okay. Let's experiment with getting a good delay on the lead vocal track. There are two ways to go about this. You can either use a mathematical formula to get the right delay setting, or you can just set it by ear until you get something you like. In this case, our song is set at 122 beats per minute. If we want the delay to fall right on the beat, then here's the formula we go by. By dividing the number of beats per minute, or BPM, into 60,000, we get the length of each quarter note in milliseconds. In our song, the BPM is 122, giving us a quarter note delay of 492 milliseconds. We can also multiply or divide this number to arrive at other mathematically correct delays. For example, 246 milliseconds will give us the correct eighth note delay. I'll call it up here on the digital delay and see how it sounds. Never tell me you love me, so I'll wait by the water and wonder. Pretty close, but I suggest using the formula just as a guideline and then using your ear to get the best setting. As you can tell, I've boosted the vocal and the delay so that you can hear the effect better. I'm still deeply in love with you. My love for you is simply overflowing, and I know that you love me too. That's pretty nice. If you want to simulate doubling a vocal, try running the vocal through the delay and setting it for about 50 milliseconds or less. I see you coming back to me, back to me. I'm feeling alright, so maybe I can make you mine. This is a very short delay and will give you kind of a doubling effect. I'm feeling alright, so maybe I can make you mine. One final powerful use for most delays is chorusing. This effect modulates the pitch of the signal above and below its original pitch. And on a guitar, for example, it would sound something like this. You can adjust the width of the pitch swing and the speed at which the effect will occur. Don't forget, when you're doing left-right panning like this, to check the sound on a mono speaker to make sure that you haven't created any phase problems. You can do, you can do this either by patching a Y cable like this from the left-right outputs to the amp, or you can just pan everything to center temporarily to see if it still sounds okay. Part of what makes a professional recording sound so good is the care that engineers take in making sure that unwanted noise is kept out of the mix. We've discussed many ways to reduce noise in the first two volumes, but here's another way you may not be familiar with, using a noise gate. We defined a noise gate in volume one, but here it is again. A noise gate is a device that listens to a signal you send into it. When the signal exceeds a certain threshold that you set, the gate opens and allows the signal to pass unaffected. When the signal drops below the threshold, however, the gate shuts down and no signal is allowed to pass through. Let me give you a very obvious and practical use for a noise gate. I'm holding here my personal Stratofake guitar. This guitar has very cheap, very noisy pickups and when I plug into an amp it usually sounds like this. Now when I'm playing you don't hear the noise so much 
But if the song calls for me to play like this, the noise is going to be way too much to live with. Here's what we do. I'll record the guitar first without any noise gain. Now I'll patch the guitar tape track into the noise gate via the insert points on the mixer. Now we're ready to adjust the controls on the noise gate to try to wipe out the guitar hum. The first control we adjust is the threshold knob. This knob determines at what point the gate will open up. If we set it too low, the gate will let nothing pass. If we set it too high, everything will pass. We can use the little light here to determine when it's about right. It's still not sounding very good though, because we need to properly adjust the last two knobs. The delay, or hold time, tells the gate how long to stay open after the signal has dropped below the threshold. In this case, we don't want much of a delay. We want it to close up pretty much right away. The rate or release knob determines how fast the gate will go from open to closed. Keep in mind though that even though it's called a gate, it's really just an electronic volume control. And it's like having someone really fast and alert pull the fader down whenever you want to kill the noise and then back up just in time for the next chord. It's much more efficient than you could be though, no offense. Noise gates can be confusing because all of the controls interact and affect each other. But if you keep the manual close and think of it in terms of a gate opening and closing, you should catch on pretty fast. Noise gates can be a lifesaver in many situations. Now you may be wondering why I didn't gate the guitar while I was recording the guitar instead of the tape track. Well, I could have done that, but it's very dangerous. Noise gates aren't human, and there's always the possibility that the gate will close down or open at the wrong time, and it's a shame to ruin a good guitar take because the gate closed down at the wrong time. Play it safe, and do it after you've recorded. It's also a good idea to compress the track before you send it to the noise gate. By limiting the dynamic range of the track, you make it easier for the gate to know when to open and close. Here are some other uses for noise gates. Eliminating clicks and buzzes. Eliminating excessive tape or mixer hiss. Creating a gated reverb sound, which is good for snare drums. Cutting down on leakage between drum mics if you're miking your drum set. And syncing two instruments together for special effects. I'll give you an example of this last one. Here's a studio trick you've probably never heard of. We're going to use our synthesizer and our noise gate to fatten the sound of the kick drum. It takes some time to set up, but it's a really useful studio tool. First, we patch the output of the synthesizer into the input of the noise gate. Now, I'm going to program the synthesizer to play a single low note continuously. The lower, the better. Now, I'll adjust the threshold on the gate until the gate is closed and we can't hear the synthesizer. Now we send a send from the kick drum into the trigger on the noise gate. The trigger input is there so you can have an outside source tell the gate when to open and close. We then patch the output of the gate into the mixer, adjust the gate, and listen to what happens. Whenever the kick drum hits, a message is sent to the trigger input of the noise gate and the gate opens briefly and lets the synthesizer note through. When the kick drum is finished, the gate shuts down. The two are perfectly synced together. And by adjusting the EQ on each, we can create a really interesting and powerful kick drum sound. Try this one out and fool your friends. Have you ever had this happen? You've spent weeks recording your new song. 
You spend hours tweaking the EQ until the song sounds incredible. Then you take it to a friend's house, pop it into his home stereo, and it sounds flat. Or the bass is way too boomy. Why does this happen? Well, usually it's because of the way you're monitoring the mix at home. Properly monitoring your music is very important to getting a consistently good sounding mix. So I'm going to spend a little time on this subject and I urge you to take these suggestions very seriously if you want to improve the quality of your recordings. Let's start with the monitor speakers. If you're like most people in your home studio, you're using your home stereo speakers because that's all you have. Plus you probably figure that since you paid big bucks for them, they'll be great for monitoring. Well here's the bad news, they're probably terrible for monitoring and here's why. Most home stereo speaker systems are designed to sound good to the average person's ear, which means that they often boost the bass and the treble. Well, this is a big problem for us recording artists, because if your speakers are telling you that there's more bass and treble in your mix than there really is, that will affect your judgment when you're recording and setting the EQ. When you record, you want the absolute truth, or else it will sound great in your studio, but it may sound lousy elsewhere. Also, most home stereo speakers are designed to be listened to at a distance. This fact alone changes the EQ characteristics of the speaker even more and allows the room to affect the sound. When we're mixing, we don't want the room to interact with the sound at all. We want to hear exactly what's going to the master tape and nothing else. So, what's the solution? Ideally, you should consider investing in a pair of dedicated studio monitors. These monitors, like these JBLs, are built specifically for monitoring your mix. They are designed to give you the absolute truth about your mix, a flat signal. In fact, when you first listen to your music on these monitors, you may think it doesn't sound as good. This is because you're used to hearing your mix on speakers that boost the frequencies that sound good to our ears. If you can't afford a pair of dedicated monitors, then here's another thing that will help. Listen to a lot of CDs on the speakers that you have. Make sure that you're not EQing at all and that bass and treble knobs on your amp are flat. Now listen to how much bass, mid-range, and treble your speakers are putting out with no EQ. When you mix, try to emulate the EQ you hear on these recordings. Okay, now where should you put your speakers? Well, for most home studios, I recommend what's called near-field monitoring. Some monitors are designed specifically for this, and it involves placing the speakers three to five feet away from you and creating a triangle between themselves and you. Arrange them so that the tweeters are facing your ears. Near-field monitoring means that we'll be hearing mostly the sound of the speakers and not so much interaction from the room. Also, you may have heard that you should put an equalizer between your amp and your monitor speakers so that you can adjust the EQ with pink noise. Well, I don't recommend this for home studios because with near-field monitors, you don't really need it. Also, adding EQ at this point can introduce noise, distortion, and phase shift to the signal. You should also pull the speakers away from the walls as much as your space permits. If your speakers are right up against the walls, you'll hear an increase in bass that's not really there. If you're using your home stereo receiver as an amp, here are a couple of things to remember. First, make sure that the loudness button is off all the time. This button boosts the bass and treble when it's engaged, and it will screw up your mix faster than any other button. Really, the only time you should consider pushing it is if you want to quickly show the client how the tape will sound on someone's home stereo or boombox with the bass and treble boosted, which on most home stereos means cranked up to 10. Also, make sure that these tone controls are set completely flat. Second, make sure that your stereo receiver has at least 50 watts per channel of power. The more power, the better, so that your speakers will be able to adequately reproduce the bass frequencies without distortion. What am I doing out here? Well, I'm listening to my rough mix on my car stereo. Now, you may laugh, but this is a fairly common practice, even in the big studios. We just want to make sure that the mix sounds good on all mediums. I'll also listen to it on my Walkman, through my television, on my jam box, and on headphones. 
Most importantly though, nearly all studios have a set of smaller, cheaper speakers below the monitors that the engineer can switch to periodically check the mix on. Again, these speakers are not to be used for critical EQ decisions. They're just there to make sure that what we're doing is on the right track and that the song is going to sound good even on grandma's cheap stereo. Now that we've talked about most of the elements that we'll be using when we mix down the song, EQ, reverb, delay, the noise gate, and how to monitor the mix, we're ready to begin mixing. If you've ever recorded in a professional studio, you've probably heard this sound for 30 seconds or so at the beginning of your master tape. You've probably also wondered why it was there. Well, there's a very good reason, and you should know it. Well, this is what engineers call laying down calibration tone. The idea here is that we're laying down a flat tone that's exactly one kilohertz. In my studio, the tone is generated by this little device, which you can buy fairly inexpensively. But some mixers have tone generators built into them. I'm sending this tone into my mixer with no EQ and with the signal pan to the center. I'll set the master level so that the VU meters read exactly 0 dB. Now I'll set the recording levels on my master recorder, in this case a PCM encoder. Since this is a digital recorder, I'll set 0 dB a little lower to give us a little headroom. I have my master recorder patched into my cassette deck for making cassette copies from the master tape, so I'll set the cassette deck's record levels to 0 dB as well. Why are we doing this? Several reasons. Number one, it ensures the optimum signal level is sent from your mixer to your master recorder. Now you can simply watch the level meters on your mixer. If they're good on the mixer, they should be good on the master recorder as well. Number two, having a reference tone ensures that a good level will be sent to the copies that you'll make from your master tape. This will ensure the best possible signal to noise ratio on your copies. And number three, other studios and duplicating houses can set the correct levels for your music. By matching your 1K calibration tone to 0 dB on their meters, other facilities can instantly match the levels of their system to yours. You should lay down at least 30 seconds of 1K tone at the beginning of every master tape that you make. Leave some space between the tone and the first song and make a note on the box as to the frequency and length of the tone. By the way, if you don't have a tone generator, you can fake it pretty well by playing a fairly flat sound from a synthesizer exactly two octaves above middle C. This is pretty close to one kilohertz. Okay, we're ready to actually mix the song, and I'll generally clean the heads of the multi-track one more time before I actually start mixing. I'll also keep my recording track sheet close by so that I can make notes of things that I do during the mix, like reverb, EQ, and delay settings, and changes that I may make during the mix. This way, if I decide to remix the song next week, it won't be so hard to recreate the sound that I got today. We've made the EQ settings we needed earlier, so let's start by getting a good relative level between the kick and the bass. For now, let's try to set them so that the master levels read about minus 4 dB as we did earlier. Now let's bring up the rest of the drums, adjusting the level until they mix well with the kick and the bass. With our foundation tracks up, let's now raise the levels of our other rhythm parts, first the guitar. Now remember, we're doing the monster guitar trick, so the tape track guitar from track 6 is panned hard left, the guitar delay is panned hard right. Now we'll bring up the piano, which is a stereo signal, two channels panned hard left and right. Now, with the rhythm tracks all up, let's bring up the vocal tracks. Remember, our lead vocal is actually doubled on two tracks. 
so we'll pan them hard left and hard right. Now at this point you may be wondering exactly how high you should bring the vocals. Well here's a tip that works well for many engineers. With the monitors fairly loud, bring up the vocal until it sounds about right. You don't want the rhythm section to drown out the vocal, but then you don't want the groove of the song to be lost because the vocal is too loud. Okay, now slowly lower the volume of the mix until you can just barely hear anything. Generally, about the last thing you should be able to hear is the vocal and the kick drum. Now let's bring up the background vocals. And I'll pan them to about 9 o'clock and 3 o'clock to give them a larger stereo spread and add some reverb for a bigger sound. We've soloed the background vocals and the main vocals because we want to get a good relative level between all of the vocals. And that's pretty nice. Remember, we don't want the background vocals to overpower the vocals, but rather to complement them. Track 7 is where we've recorded the delay for the vocal, so let's bring it up until we get a level that's pretty good. Not too high. We don't want to sound like we're covering up for a bad vocalist. We just want to thicken the sound a little bit. Now at this point we need to pay special attention to our mix. Also on track 7 right here is the saxophone lead. And as you can tell the level and the EQ for the sax is not the same as the level and the EQ for the delay. We need to raise it quite a bit. Also add a little bit of reverb. Obviously we're going to have to make some pretty quick changes as we mix. So here's how we do it. First, I'll make a note on the track sheet as to the level and EQ for the delay part on track 7. In this case, I'm not putting any EQ on the delay part. Since I'll have to make a change pretty fast, I'll put down a piece of tape here by channel 7 and make a note of the volume setting for the delay and where I need to go for the volume setting for the saxophone solo. This is going to be a quick change, and I have to remember to bring the level back down right after the saxophone solo for the vocal delay part again. This is something I definitely want to practice before I do the mix for real. Okay, all of our levels, pan positions, and EQ are set. We're almost ready to begin mixing. Before we do though, let's make sure that the tracks are what we call clean. To illustrate this, let's look at a background vocal track. This track is actually blank for a good portion of the song. The only time we have background vocals is during the choruses and at the end. During the rest of the song, the only thing that's playing is blank tape, which means a certain amount of blank tape hiss. Also, there may be other unwanted sounds during these periods like coughs or rustling papers. Remember that we want to eliminate as much of this garbage as possible, no matter how small, to achieve the best possible sound, and there are several ways to do this. Number one, if you're using a reel-to-reel -reel or digital multi-track, you should be able to actually spot erase blank sections. This will get rid of the coughs and rustling papers, but it's somewhat gutsy. Whenever you start erasing, you take a chance that you'll erase something you wanted to keep, but still, pros do it all the time. Number two, turn off the mixer tracks or pull the faders down during blank sections of the song. It's a pretty simple matter to just pull the faders down during the verses and up again during the choruses of the song. Even better, leave the vocals alone and just turn off and on the tracks from the mixer. And finally, number three, some mixers allow you to use your sequencer to automatically mute the faders at the right time via MIDI. This takes a little time to set up, but it's the most accurate and best sounding way to go. Okay, the only other thing I need to know before I start mixing is when to start fading the song out at the end. 
I need to decide now because I don't want to wing it and then run out of song before I've got the faders all the way down at the end of the mix. Playing the song, it looks like the best time to fade will be about 317 on the Simpty time code counter or tape counter number 380 if you're not using time code. This song begins at exactly five seconds on the Simpty counter, so I'll also wait until the last possible moment to bring up the master faders to eliminate any noise that may exist before the song actually begins. Okay, let's start the mix. At this point, since we've worked backwards, our levels, EQ, pan, and effects are set. The only thing I need to remember is to change the level of track 7 right before the sax solo and again right after, plus fade out at the end. I think I can handle it. I thank you for watching, and I urge you to apply as many of these tips and top secret techniques we've discussed in your home recordings as you can. Good luck, and here's hoping you make it big.